to see you this evening and um, appreciate those who are going to stay around to help with uh, preparations for Discipleship University. One other announcement that I forgot to ask Charles to uh, remind us about was that I do want to remind the parents that our reading program, our summer reading program is still going on and uh, that's going to be this Tuesday at 1030. So I want to encourage you to bring your uh, kids to that. Uh, that's held in our library. Um, we have a, a guest reader come in and read to them a story and they have a craft and a snack and I uh, just want you to encourage you to take advantage of that or if you know of any little ones um, who are neighbors or friends who might be interested in that, encourage them to come and, and enjoy that time. Throughout our study of Hosea, we have seen a, a conflict between God's faithfulness and the faithlessness of the people of Israel. There's a tension there between God's devotion to His covenant and His deep covenant love for His people and for His purpose and for His glory and the utter disregard of Israel for God's glory and for God's law and for the relationship that is there. And so in order for God to call them back to Him, it almost seems like a, a last desperate measure as we saw at the beginning of the book. He calls Hosea to picture the type of love and at the same time the quality of agony that God has over the faithlessness of Israel to loving him and to following his covenant. And so he calls Hosea to take a wife of whoredom, of prostitution. And, and in this relationship, this relationship that when we initially look at it, we say, Man, that, that, that doesn't seem appropriate. That doesn't seem, it almost seems audacious. That almost seems uh, something that God wouldn't do. And yet God is the one who brings this, this picture before us to say, this is how much I love Israel and this is how she has treated me. And so God is devoted to His covenant with His people. And so, throughout this book, we've seen this tension. Is there a wasp behind me? You guys are looking kind of... <laughs> like there's one like on my head or something. Okay. <laughs> well, the wasp, the, wasp, the wasp honestly isn't the worst thing that's ever happened to me in the middle of a sermon. I had a bat flying in one of my sermons in the church building once. And so that was kind of terrifying. All right, so we'll try and concentrate and hopefully uh, uh, Tim, the wasp killer, will get it in a second. But, um, but anyways, uh, so throughout the book, we see God's faithfulness and Israel's faithlessness. And you're trying to kind of see this tension and resolve this tension between, as we saw last week, God is deeply agonizing over His love for Israel. It's almost like a fatherly, paternal relationship. You know, God reaches out to His people in fatherly devotion and love. And He doesn't simply see them as wicked sinners who are irredeemable, although He does, is going to pour out His wrath and judgment upon Him, but there are always words of hope on the other sides of those words of judgment. God is always going to, to bring them back. He doesn't simply leave them within their wickedness. He is going to redeem them back to Him. Well, as we close out the book in Hosea chapter 14 tonight, we see that tension kind of come to a climax in which we see God's faithfulness and Israel's response. And I think that when we look at both sides of this, we understand that within salvation, within redemption, there is this faithfulness of God and His devotion to you as His child and His devotion to His people, but then our responsibility as well and our struggle in our own walk of faith in being dedicated and faithful to that covenant. And I think that we see this in, in, in various ways in Hosea chapter 14. So I want us to read Hosea 14 together and then we'll dive into the text and find a few points together tonight. <clears throat> it says, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to Him, Take away all iniquity and accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls and vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you the orphan finds mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. 
He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and His fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. But transgress transgressors stumble in them. Just a couple of things I want to notice before we get to our points. The first one being is that if you notice, the text begins and ends with stumbling. If you notice in verse 1, For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. That is, they're trying to walk a straight path, but they can't even walk right. They keep stumbling. They keep tripping. They can't get in a proper rhythm. They can't get to where they want to be because of their iniquity. But then notice at the end... He's not talking about them stumbling because of their wickedness. He's actually talking about them stumbling over the Word of God. That is, they can't even uh, conform to the Word of God because of their wickedness. And so, what you see here is a contrast. That is, as long as you are living a wicked, iniquitous lifestyle, you cannot fully walk with God. There has to be an alignment of your steps with His purpose. But then also notice that there's a, con uh, a, a, a contrast in the text, text excuse me, from the beginning where they're saying, we, we, we will do with this, we will do this, and God saying, starting in verse 4, I, I, I. That's that, that tension I'm talking about between God's faithfulness and Israel. The first thing that we want to notice um, this evening is that God's cleansing comes at our confession. God's cleansing comes at our confession. Notice, previously throughout Hosea, one of the issues that Hosea has discussed is the problem with Israel still living a wicked, iniquitous life and yet continuing the train of sacrifice. Remember we talked about that. The sacrifices keep on coming. The sacrifices keep on coming. The blood keeps spilling. But there's no true repentance. There's no true reformation of life. It's just this continual external religion. But no inner, inner relationship with the Lord. But now that's changed. This is what God is wanting. He says, go to Him and the sacrifice, if you will, initially, the initial sacrifice is confession. Take with Him, not Although he does say in a moment that they will pay with bulls, but the only power that that sacrifice has is because it is coupled with confession. Your words make this sacrifice important, he says. And this is what they're to say, take away our iniquity, accept what is good, we'll pay with bulls and vow of our love. And now notice verse 3, Assyria cannot save us, and we will not ride on horses. Now that sounds like an odd confession to our ears. Lord, we're not going to trust in Assyria and we won't ride on horses anymore, right? What, what are they talking about here? What do they mean? The Israelites were not supposed to be breeding and riding on and using horses in battle. That's one of the things that, that God prohibits within the law. You might remember that. The kings didn't always obey that. And Solomon definitely didn't obey that. Why was that? That seems like an odd thing. Why would God prevent them... They could have a mule, they, they, if I remember correctly, they could have a mule, they could have a donkey, but not a horse. Why? Because the horse was a, was a weapon of war. It was a powerful animal that many times would bring with it arrogance and pride and reliance upon the strength of the animal instead of reliance upon the strength of God. And so what they've done is they've been riding on horses and they're saying, we're not going to ride on horses anymore. We'll go back to walking. We'll ride on donkeys. There's not much intimidating about someone riding to you on a donkey, right? So we'll, we'll go back to doing this. Why? They're showing a complete renunciation of self-reliance and upon reliance upon other nations. We're not going to do that anymore, God. We're going to put our trust fully and completely in you. Now, we might not need to confess. There's nothing wrong, of course, with riding on horses in, in today's culture in today's society or within the new covenant. But there might be things in your life that you are trusting in more than God. 
There might be things in your life that you need to confess to Him that says, you know what, God, I'm trusting in these things too much. And I find it interesting that He mentions other nations. Because I think if we're not careful in American society, it is very, very easy for politics to become an idol for Christians. And I think that if we're not careful, we start trusting in a particular candidate or a particular party to bring America back to God, right? And, and there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with, with voting or, or being politically involved, but we have to be mindful of that and realizing that God is the only one that can make all nations right before Him. Right? He, he is the only one, and, and, and we have to realize that as the kingdom, we're a kingdom inside of a kingdom. As a Christian, your number one priority is not America. Your number one priority is the kingdom of Christ. And that kingdom extends beyond the borders of our nation. And our priorities have to align with that first and American politics or parties secondly. It really discourages me. There, there, there's people that I have on Facebook. Now, realize that I am not thinking of any of you in particular when I make this statement. I'm really not. But I was just thinking about this the other day. I have friends on Facebook, Christian friends, and I see them post political blogs, political stories all the time. But I never see them post a Christian blog. I never see them post a blog encouraging their brothers and sisters in Christ. I never see them really posting anything about kingdom work. It's all about resharing or reposting some new political thing that has happened that week. Now, I promise you, I'm not thinking about any of you, so please don't come up to me afterwards and say, well, you must have been talking about me. I'm not talking about any of you, because I, I don't have anyone, and I don't even remember who it was that I saw the other day that it made me think that, and there were various friends that I have to do that, and I'm guilty of that as well at times. But we just need to be mindful and do some self-examination and ask ourselves, who do we place our trust in for salvation? Who do we really trust to save us? I think that's a question worth asking. And notice that he says, we will, or they say, the confession that they're supposed to say, we will say no more, our God to the work of our hands. That is, idolatry which has been at the heart of this issue. He says, we're renouncing that. We're putting aside our own conventions, our own cleverness, which is represented within the physical material thing of idolatry. And we're not going to say, this is our God anymore. See, that's convenient. You know, idolatry is easy, right? If you make the God, you know what else you get to determine? How you, want it to, how you want to worship it, right? What's that God need? You can determine what that God needs, right? Although they might not think of it in that way. What is that, God, what, what is that God's will for your life? It's whatever you want it to be, right? And, and, and don't we give that type of power to a lot of things in our life? A lot of things that we make by our own hands? And so he says... We're not going to shape God by our own hands. We're going to recognize who the true God is. And through this confession, this is what this is kind of the arch, the theme that begins at the very beginning of Hosea and is now coming to an end. This is what God has been desiring. This is what He is hoping for by calling Hosea to this crazy relationship that He's called him to. This is what God wants, true repentance, true confession, so that He can cleanse. And notice, God isn't standing back and saying, Hey, after all they've done, after all they've done, you think that I'm going to just forgive them that easily? You think I'm just going to look over things? No, there's an expectation of God's forgiveness, right? And it reminds me of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've had people come to me sometimes and say, well, how do I know if God has forgiven me? Because He says He has. That's what John is saying there. We're saying, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. 
Now, I might look at Jacob and I might wonder, have I truly forgiven this person? But I should not question whether God has truly forgiven to me if I've confessed my sin and turned my life over to Him. I know He's forgiven me. He's faithful, as we've seen in Hosea, to His covenant. And He is just. So there shouldn't be any question on the part of the Christian if you've confessed that sin to God and you've turned that over to Him and you're sitting there wondering if on Judgment Day God's going to say, Aha! You, you thought I forgot about that, didn't you? You thought I missed that one. He is faithful and He is just. Cleansing comes at confession. Secondly, what we see within the text is that God's healing is enough for our hurt. God's healing is enough for our hurt. They have confessed, and what is the response of God? Again, does He sit back and say, no, it's not that easy. No, notice what He says, I will heal them. I will love them freely. Now, we could do an entire sermon over that phrase, but that is the key. That is the heart of the unconditional love that God has constantly displayed to Israel and that Hosea has displayed to Gomer. I've loved them freely. What does he mean by that? They haven't paid me for this love. They're not deserving of this love. And yet I have freely loved them out of my abundance. As he says in Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I will love them freely. And then he says, I'll be like the dew to Israel. Notice there's this very descriptive language here in which the dew, which is a very important part of the ecosystem of Israel in which it is a very necessary part of the agriculture. He says, I'll be like the, the dew. He says, I'll be like the dew and he shall blossom, take root, spread. Notice the description. He will be beautiful. He will smell good. The fragrance of Lebanon there in verse 6. And they will return and dwell beneath my shadow. They're going to flourish. They shall blossom like the vine. But the point is here is that all of the, the wickedness, all of the, the, the agony, all of the pain that they've endured is going to be healed by God. And that's enough. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you're wondering if God can really fix this? If God can really heal this? If God can, can really really make this right? And the answer of Scripture is yes. That His healing is more than enough for our hurt. That within the new heavens and within the new earth, He's going to redeem that sorrow. His love is enough. And that's what He's promising Israel. You're not going to come back to agony. If you come to me, I'm not going to be sitting over here as a disgruntled dad just kind of closing you out because you've hurt me so bad. He says, I'm going to accept you and I'm going to heal you from the agony and from the pain. The ironic thing, the ironic thing is that God is really the one that's hurt in this relationship. And Israel should be the one coming to God and saying, God, what can we do to fix this? What can we do to make this right? But God is coming to them and He's saying, I'm going to make this right. So our third and final point this evening is that God's future is greater than your failings. God's future is greater than your failings. Notice that, again, he's talking about all of this abundance and all of these things. He's saying, if you will come to me, I'm going to make you beautiful. I'm going to establish you. I'm going to make you grow. I'm going to make you wonderful. They are deserving of none of this. They have rejected Him time and time again. And He says, when you come back to Me, it's not simply so that you can sit at the, the, the stool of My table. I'm coming back to make you abound. I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to magnify you. That one of the greatest lies we fall into as Christians and as God's people 
is convincing ourselves that, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is convincing ourselves that there is something good outside of God. It's convincing ourselves that God is trying to hold you back. That He doesn't want you to be happy. That He doesn't want you to flourish. And we, we fall into that lie all the time. That's why we sin. Because sin is essentially a lack of faith in the provision and in the power of God. That's what sin is. That's exactly the lie that Adam and Eve fell into. It's the exact same lie that we fall into every single time that we sin. We are essentially saying to God, you're not enough. You are not enough. And God says, I am more than enough. I am more than enough. I love how he says, I love the imagery that he uses here when he says that he is the, he in, in verse 8, I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Your fruit. Notice that. that he says, even if you have abundance, if you have success, if you have joy, that comes from me. Now this should remind you of John chapter 15. And what Jesus says, I am the vine. And you are the branches. And you can do nothing. What? Apart from me. You can do nothing apart from me. But the, the, this is the message of hope. Is that God's future for you is greater than your failings. Right? That when God looks at you, He doesn't see someone that is irredeemable. He doesn't see someone that is a lost cause. If you're here tonight, if you're still breathing, He still sees you as an individual who He can save, who He can redeem. And there is never a point, there is never going to be a point in your life in which God stops loving you. You cannot make God stop loving you. As he said to the Israelites, I love you freely. Now the final note here from Hosea is, is one for us and one that I hope that you'll take with you as we close out this study. Verse 9, if you're wise, understand these things. If you're discerning, know these things. For the ways of the Lord are right and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. There's a message here, Hosea is saying, for anyone who's willing to listen. And that is that the ways that we so often choose for ourselves, the paths that we so often take, relying on ourselves, relying on others, relying on wickedness apart from God, that is failure. That, that's nothing but stumbling, he says. But God willingly receives you into His arms and will make you abound for His glory. If you want to Come to that God this evening for whatever need. Why don't you come? Together we stand and as we sing.